Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners issues and updates on this Tuesday, June 6, 2023. County Administrator Gary Schmidt, what's up first? Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Savas is attending a Joint Policy Committee on Transportation uh, Conference, so he is out of the office today. Uh, your meeting as the Board of Commissioners for all items today will start with consent agenda review. Uh, the item for elected officials, the Sheriff's Office is asked to pull that for one more additional week, so we'll bring that back to you next week. Disaster management, perfect timing. Uh, first item, disaster management. Item one, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the State of Oregon for lease of the medical examiner's office space. Total contract value is $81,625.44 for two years. Funding is through budgeted county general funds. Daniel Nybauer, Director of Disaster Management, go ahead. Good morning, commissioners. This agreement is with the state of Oregon and allows us to use the office space in the medical examiner as well as the other facilities they have. It also allows us use of the MDI log, which is what, what? I, I'm the, sorry. Uh, the, MD, the medical legal death investigator log, which is what the uh, medical examiners use to track their cases. And so it's a relatively low cost over two years. And where is this located? Uh, in Happy Valley, right below where the Costco is in the, in the state police uh, office building there. I can look the, I can find the address for you to be exact. Yeah, I don't see an address on this agreement. Is there, did I miss that? Uh, it's on exhibit A. It is uh, 13309 Southeast 84th Avenue okay. in Clackamas County. Okay. Um, on the um, introductory policy page, it would be nice for the future if we could have that. Yep, got it. Yes, fine. Um, Daniel, totally fine. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? So Daniel, is the Oregon legislature going to defund medical examiners? I don't know. Trent can answer that question when he comes up. <laughs> yeah, I'm putting you all on the spot. They better yeah, not because they're, because there goes more general fund, out, general fund money out the window. <clears throat> Just saying. I hope somebody's listening. Daniel Nybauer, seeing no further objections. Thank you for coming forward today. <laughs> Thank you. Next, yeah. Health, Housing, Human Services, Item 1, Approval of a Contract Renewal with this Dergish do, Doing Business as Econo Lodge Southeast for on-call hotel rooms for temporary housing and shelter to our most vulnerable residents. Contract renewal value is $1,030,500 for one year. Funding is through Supportive Housing Services Measure Funds. No county general funds are involved. Adam Brown, Deputy Director, Health, Housing, Human Services. Go ahead. Good morning. Adam Brown, Deputy Director, Health, Housing, and Human Services. I I thought I was prepared for all the questions I might get, but now I'm not so sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this agreement was originally presented at issues on April 23rd, and the board asked staff to work with the motel owner to address a number of concerns related to the overall condition of the property uh, and its impact on the surrounding community. So we did that uh, and gave you an overview of that at issues last week. Um, we have a new section in the agreement, or actually a revised section. So what was section 27, um, inspections, is now titled inspection slash good neighbor efforts and includes uh, provisions related to the upkeep of the asset by the owner. Uh, commissioners, do we have any questions on this? Commissioner Scholl? Yes, good morning. Uh, I, in your documentation here, I don't see a room rate per night. Yeah, so the room rate is is $100 per night. Okay. And uh, then on uh, additional liability, cost, repairs, uh, how does that work? How is that determined? Uh, for example, uh, if we have a liability for doing some sort of uh, damage repair, how is that, how is the price determined? So, um and just like uh, you know any other so this is a cost reimbursement agreement right so if the if one of our program participants um, damages one of the rooms or um, you know the owner has to make repairs then they they carry out their their repairs based on you know the private market rate for doing those repairs and they invoice us for that cost but they're required to provide us with supporting documentation right as part of our 
accounting practices, we require that to reimburse them for that expense. And will, th will that amount uh, come out of the total contract renewal uh, value of one million thirty thousand five hundred? That's correct. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Mm, for the questions or comments, see no objections. Item two, approval of a grant agreement with the Oregon Department of Housing and Community Services for programs related to the governor's state of emergency due to homelessness. Total value is $1,883,236, funding through the state of Oregon. No county general funds are involved. So this is the second of two agreements with Oregon Housing and Community Services related to the state's emergency order on homelessness and the $200 million dollars Approves, uh, approved by the legislature in House Bills 2001 and 2009. You approved the first agreement on May 4th, which was for outreach and rapid rehousing activities. And the second agreement is for eviction prevention rent assistance funds being distributed through community action agencies. So the state bifurcated its process for allocating these funds and the social services division acts as the community action agency for Clackamas County. So the funds are flowing through social services, whereas that first agreement was with our Housing and Community Development Division. Uh, Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, thanks. It's nice to see you, Adam. Thanks. So with the continuum of care, are we um, kind of morphing that into more of an integrated system at this point? Yeah, yeah. That, that's right. So. Okay. You know, this year we formed the Housing and Community Development Division, right. which was our department's effort to consolidate all of our housing and homeless services under the purview of a single division. Um, you know, historically some of those services have been delivered by social services. Um, others were, you know, the Housing Authority, sure. Community Development, et cetera. So over time we're slowly working to consolidate the services, the first step was the formation of the new division. Some of this programming does still live in social services, okay. but we're partnering really closely with them almost on a daily basis around the provision of all of our housing related services. Okay. Do we have external community members yet involved in a continuum of care, like similar to Lane County, or is that an option as we move forward, do you think? We, we do still have our COC steering committee, which okay. we're, we're in the process of shifting to a broader homeless services advisory committee okay. as part of our redesign of our homeless services advisory structure. That's in process now. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Sure. I appreciate it. Further questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Sorry. Next tourism, item one, approval of an amendment increasing funding from and extending duration of a professional services contract with Travel Portland. The amendment value is $256,018 for 12 months. Total contract value is increased to $425,529 for three years. Funding is through Travel Portland. No county general funds are involved. Samara Phelps, Tourism Executive Director, go ahead. Hi, Samara Phelps, Director of Tourism. And yes, this contract is to receive funds. Uh, the contract is with Travel Portland, but the funds come from the state transient lodging tax. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have questions. What, what are these funds going to be used for? Yeah, these funds go towards a program of work that is specific to the tourism industry here in Clackamas County. So they've been used for advertising um, that is really great because we can target our metro area lodging properties, give them a little competitive advantage, and uh, be able to track that. So often it is that or public relations work, um, and sometimes it is used for development work. So we do scholarships for our participants to do continuing education through attending conferences, that kind of thing. Okay. Okay. For the questions, seeing no objections, thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, technology services, item one, approval of a board order authorizing a purchase order through a cooperative contract with CDWG for HPE Aruba network switches. Total value is $399,333.98 for an estimated seven-year life cycle. Funding is through department cost allocations. No county general funds are involved. Lenu Parapilia, Director of Technology Services, and Dave DeVore. Go ahead, please, and please please say what the acronyms are. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. We are here to request uh, your approval for the purchase of 85 Aruba network access layer switches. And uh, the purchase is through CDWG using a cooperative agreement the total value is $399,333. And the current network switches actually are at the end of support. So we need to up, uh, upgrade them. This is actually the final phase of a multi-year plan to modernize our county network. 
Uh, the new switches provide higher functionality, greater security, which is a requirement for our CGIS compliance, which is the criminal justice information systems compliance. No county general funds are involved, and we request you to approve this purchase. Questions or comments from commissioners? Commissioner West. Please forgive my ignorance. Can you explain to me what a switch is and why it's important? Like, I, um, I'm just not sure what we're actually purchasing. It sounds super important on the paperwork, <laughs> but in reality, I don't, I don't know what this is. So these are the switches that actually connect, you know, our uh, devices that we use to our network, you know, so that is a very simple explanation. Our printers, our laptops and everything. So there are multiple layers to that. So we have been actually um, slowly replacing all of that. So this is the final uh, one. So some of those already have been already upgraded. And so these are old infrastructure that we have replacing with the new, what, you know, whatever the best industry of practices are regarding this technology infrastructure, mm -hmm. is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no further questions or objections, thank you. What is HPE? What is, what is HPE? Sorry? What is HPE? It says HPE oh, networks. High performance, and I forgot what E stands for to be honest with you. Okay. Is it in the staff report? If it's not, it will be. Will you please update the staff report and identify the acronyms? Thank you very much. All right, next, transportation and development. Item one, approval of an intergovernmental agreement for provisions of building inspection plan review services with the city of Happy Valley. Agreement value is up to $50,000 per year for five years. Funding is through restricted development permit fees. No county general funds are involved. Dan Johnson, Director of Transportation and Development. Go ahead. Good morning, Chair Smith. Commissioners, uh, essentially before you today for consideration is a mutually beneficial intergovernmental agreement between Clackamas County and the city of Happy Valley for basically uh, plan review and um, uh, building inspection services. Basically, these kind of agreements allow us to be flexible and adapt to our um, various staffing needs and or our workload or capacity issues we may face. We have had a, an IGA in place before that allowed um, the city to use our services. Um, this is basically uh, replacing that IGA and making it mutually beneficial if we have the need for their services and if they have the capacity and we can use them. I want to make sure we're clear that um, there are no positions being impacted by this by this IGA. Um, and basically, again, that it surplants the 2000 IGA we currently have in place with the city. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Next. Item two, approval of a contract with North Santiam Paving Company for Chip Rock Supply and Hall. Total value is $335,740. Funding through the county road fund. No county general funds are involved. Chip seal. We do chip seal on mm -hmm. some roads. It's a certain type of maintenance that, um, that uh, retains the quality and li long life span of the roadway. Essentially, we are buying 7,600 tons of rock to do two specific chip seal projects, one at Wilsonville um, and the other at Essicada and Eagle Crest. Um, those are scheduled to begin this summer. Essentially, this is advanced acquisition of materials to be stockpiled at certain locations so that we have access to them and then we can move forward with the chip seal project. Commissioner West. Is this a new relationship or is this the, the, who, the, the vendor who's provided the, us these products in the past or is this like a new? It's basically simple. I mean, we went out, I probably should have read that, my apologies. This is not a new relationship, but the, okay. basically the project, we have to advertise them in accordance with ORS and LCRB rules. Um, those uh, bids were accepted um, and opened on May 26th and it was determined this was the lowest qualified bidder as a part of that process. To provide those? To provide these materials. These materials for your work, yep. okay. And what, what is chip? Can you explain what the chip thing, what, is it like gravel? Well, <laughs> it's, it's more than gravel. Um, it is basically a way where they apply a mixture of rock and a um, slurry seal over the rock in the roadbed mm -hmm. uh, to provide traction. It also provides, again, extends the livelihood and length of the road. Is it like, does it look like asphalt or? Yes. It does? Okay, yes. thank you. A little rougher. I mean, it's okay. a little rougher, but it's, it's not like a grind and inlay where we pave the whole new road. It's basically a rock surface or bed that goes over it, and there's an oil mat that's put over it that then, um, again, protects the quality of the road. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, further questions or comments? Seeing no objections. <laughs> Item three, approval of a personal services contract with Acela for migrating the Acela on-premises software to the Acela cloud hosted SAAS platform with five years annual maintenance. The total contract value is $1,116,902.50 for five years. Funding is through development permit fees. No county general funds are involved. Okay. Um, we have... Um, DTD uses um, what's called the Acela automation permitting software. It's, it's the primary permitting software that we have um, for, throughout our organization. And it's used for building permits, engineering permits, and any type of per majority of the permits that we issue, okay? Um, it, it deals with routing, processing, approving, and issuance, all, all the technicality around our internal coordination around the permit. Um, does, uh, calculates fee collection, et cetera. Um, so it's on the financial side as well. We have had this software for quite some time, okay? And we have been assessing what the most, what the clear, two things, what the cleanest path forward is to get our software upgraded to current standards. Our, the software we have is relatively old. And then secondly, what, what's the cheapest path to get there, okay? And essentially, we have assumed and, and assessed the fact that entering into this contract uh, with, Ex with Excella essentially allows us to take the on-site system that we have right now and take it to the cloud, and we do it in the cloud, okay? And what that, and it also, I'm gonna highlight the fact that it's under a very, um, we have special contract pricing right now, and while the total amount seems high, the rates that we are getting charged are low, okay? Um, compared to the rest of the market. But essentially, with this upgrade, a couple things that will happen. One, it's going to remove the need to have on-site servers host the software, so on-site being here on the facility. Reduce the demands on uh, uh, tech services staff um, as the vet vendor will become responsible um, for the maintaining and updating the software. It's going to also provide the ability to add a ge um, geographic information systems module and enhanced support systems. The ge um, geographic information systems, or, or it's known as GIS, allows you to coordinate um, um, tabular data or data points and, and represent them um, visually and geographically on a map. So it allows that conversion of data from the physical form into the visual form and allows you to assess and market and, and see where patterns of certain uh, growth or development or inspection are taking place. Um, approval of this purchase, well back up. Uh, in negotiations, the vendor is under a cooperative pricing agreement. DTD was able to secure incentivized pricing that is available if the cooperative contract is executed prior to June 30th, 2023. This cooperative pricing results in a savings of over $333,000. Um, it's a five-year contract. Um, you can see on the first page of the contract, um, extends through 2027. Um, annual costs are anywhere from $189,000 to $230,000 on the out years. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, uh, but essentially, in short, this reduces on-site responsibility for TS, transfers that to our consultant or our um, supplier, and um, provides the services at cheaper cost. Uh, Dan, thank you for that. On page three, there's an annual fee use. Now, are payments made yearly, or do we pay all of it in one lump sum? Just Thank you. Month or? Yearly. yearly. Yeah. So Annually. the first year through 24 is 189000 The next year is, so we make those payments yearly. I like that idea. Correct. Thank you very much. I'd also like to highlight no general fund associated with this, as the county right. administrator said. It's all through um, restricted services funding. So. That's very good, because uh, I, during COVID, this particular department really turned on a dime and uh, was able to implement uh, online um, electronic application for a lot of the building permits and all kinds of permits. And I'm sure this will enhance those services further. Just curious, is there any other uh, regions or uh, neighbors um, that are using software like this? I mean, are we like... Okay, yeah, where are we on the pecking order? I'm not competitive or anything. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Smith and Commissioner Cheryl Bell, Assistant Director of Development for the Department. Um, yeah, no, we are, 
We are probably leading in what we're doing with our two platforms. We have two different types of software. We have this one we're talking about today, which is our Excella. It's our engine, drives everything that we do. And then we have our online permitting software, which is how you apply and how we do plan review, and that's through Evolve, it's Project Docs, or we branded it Development Direct. Um, so there's, we um, are with those two companies because they are the primary ones used by most jurisdictions in Oregon, so it's fam familiarity for our customers when they come in. They've seen those projects before, but we are pushing the system quite a bit, doing pretty innovative things, and um, it's this good relationship with the vendors that's helping us do that. So is this a Scylla program that you're buying this whole new, is it integrated with what the user does? Is it user-friendly type? I mean, do they go together like this? It's, um, it's kind of the engine in the background. So the users are primarily using our other platform, our development direct platform. But this Excella is our current permitting system, so we're, we're familiar with it. This upgrade's gonna give our customers better options. Okay. And, it, um, and these two vendors, um, the one that the customer uses, the, uh -huh. the Development Direct and Excella, they are par business partners. So they partner really well, and that's one of the other options in this contract is if um, we're developing new things, these two partners really wanna see those succeed and they'll work together. Yeah, I like the way this is going, very good. Yeah, Commissioner West. <clears throat> so we're looking to go into a contract that is valued at about 1.1 million, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and it's with the current vendor that we've already had established good relationship with. Yes. So is this base, is this like an upgrade into the service level from 1990s to 2023? Yes, we're yeah. upgrading our system. Um, we haven't done an upgrade in a while, primarily because of COVID. Okay. Um, and so with this, we're going to the cloud, we're doing a migration to the cloud, and we're getting an upgrade of the system. And we're deferring other internal costs that we would be having to pay to subsidize the internal operation of the right. software. Is that internal, op and you, those would be, um, it sounds expensive and dated in its process if we went that route? It, um, this is, this, this reduces our internal liability our county liability in regards to the software and the maintenance of it, and reduces our, our overall costs. Okay. It is the cheapest, most efficient, and reasoned way to move forward with advancing the software. Um, does it also give you guys more tools within the software to be more better customer service, more responsive, better data for better information? Are we for a good cost and less liability? This is a reasonable upgrade? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This is <clears throat> quite informative and exciting. Thank We're excited you. too. <laughs> yes, see no f objections. Go forward. Thank you. Uh, that is it for the request for consent agenda. All these items will be on this Thursday's business meeting agenda. Next, Clackamas County Investment Policy Review. Clackamas County Treasurer Brian Nava will present. There was a memo in your packet and the policy. Good morning. Am I on? Yes. Good. Thanks, Gary. Nice to see everybody, commissioners. Happy to be Welcome. here today to present the uh, Clackamas County Investment Policy. The Clackamas County Investment Policy provides the framework for the investment of the county's public funds by the Treasurer's Office. The county chooses to purchase investments with a maturity between 0 to 36 months. This policy was last reviewed and approved by the Board of County Commissioners on January 18th, 2022. There exists no dollars associated with this approval, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, um, Treasurer Nava. Are you bound by state investment laws? Correct, yes. ORS 294 is the main investment uh, law that we follow as it relates to our investment policy, and yes, we are definitely bound by those. And then, do you invest at what type of institutions? Uh, geez, so we have a plethora of different institutions mm -hmm. we can invest in. I mean, for example, if you look at our portfolio, we've done the Clackamas County School District, uh, which was great. We also do a lot of U U.S. Treasuries, which was a little scary up until uh, the last week, uh, but they've increased the debt ceiling is what I'm referring to there. And so we'll do yeah. federal farm credits. And so we have a, a really diverse por portfolio that we invest in. And um, you, at banks, do you buy CDs? Uh, do you buy high-yield 
Correct, yes. We'll, we'll buy uh, some CDs and then we have money markets in the various banks to, uh, to ensure our liquidity. So our priorities are really safety, liquidity, yield in that order. And so, you know, I won't go into the Silicon Valley bank uh, uh, kind of situation, but we invest in a lot of money markets at the various banks. We try and do a lot of local banks too, Lewis and Clark Bank, uh, things like that to invest back into our local community as well. So what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and some of these <clears throat> mid-sized uh, banks was they um, invested in treasuries and then the interest rates came going up and for whatever reason, they were not nimble enough to take some of those investments and move them over to the other side of the ledger and therefore they failed. So when you say that you invest in treasuries and, and U.S. bonds, uh, I assume what percentage of the county's investments are in those bonds compared to the other. Right, right. So generally speaking, we're, we're do, we do a cash flow analysis, so we're constantly looking at our liquidity so that one of the main priorities we have is that we're, that we're not having to call investments, so that we're not falling victim to uh, a little bit of what Silicon Valley Bank did, which was they didn't have enough liquidity. So when they, and don't quote me on these numbers, but I believe they had to cash in $20 billion of investments and only got $18 billion back mm -hmm. so because they didn't have the liquidity available right. to pay their bills, uh, more or less, or pay the people as so they come to So what percentage, again, of the county's investments are in U.S. Treasuries versus the other? I can get you that information. Okay. I don't have it sitting right here, but I'll, I'll definitely okay. get it. I'm just curious because mm -hmm. people listening to this, they want to know that we're solvent. It's their taxpayer money, and we are, and that's why I'm asking these questions. Our Treasury Department's doing very, very good. So you invest, uh, you, the banks that you use, uh, like you say, different types of investments are federally chartered? Correct. So they have the FDIC and insurance. And state chartered? Yep, correct, correct. Chartered. And, and when you say cha state chartered, those are some more of our smaller regional banks. Correct. We do big and small, and they all fall under the, a qualified depository. And so they're actually, their, their collateralization rules are much higher than what would be required for your and I bank accounts. So if you look quarterly, Oregon State Treasury actually requires those banks to submit their collateralization levels. And it, right now it's about two thirds collateralized and they oh. collateralize each other as well. So if one of those banks fails, the other banks will have to kind of pick up that slack. So our, our money, I would argue, is uh, it, nationally speaking, uh, every local government, is, as long as they're following the rules is probably the safest money that as long as the there. banks are following the rules correct 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 yes mm -hmm. that's the issue that's a little bit scary but thank you very much brian uh we have a couple uh comments commissioner Scholl. yes good morning treasurer nava morning when you look at the the potential changes in the u.s economy in the coming year two years uh do you have any mechanism for uh uh, uh, assessing uh, Clackamas County investments uh, and I guess what I'm trying to say is do you have a, an ability to be flexible in these investments uh, should the uh, future economy look like it might be changing? Absolutely. So within this investment policy with a zero to 36 month range, that's where we're constantly looking at. So I sit on the Oregon Short Term Fund Board. Um, I also am the legislative representative for the Oregon Association of County Treasurer and Finance Officers and, on, and the MDAC uh, representative as well, which is Municipal Debt Advisory Committee, um, while also, um, uh, like I presented, kind of the budget, keeping a pulse on and keeping in contact with not only Oregon State Treasury, but the Oregon Economic Development Office and their reports. So constantly changing and constantly ensuring we have the liquidity and flexibility so that as the, as the market changes, we're ready to um, also change with that market as well. Okay, good. That's good to hear. Thank you. Commissioner West. Uh, so recently in the news, we've had some economic concerns with small banks going under medium to small time, small banks um, uh, in the country here. Does that type of activity <clears throat> with these small banks put us at some type of risk within our plan or do we adjust and look to that kind of dynamic thing happening right now. I don't know if we'll see, you know, more banks in the future struggling and going under. Uh, what, what, how does the, how does something like that, like impact the county and its investments? No, that's a good question, Commissioner West. I, I, it, I mean, there is an impact for sure. Um, uh, the banks we work with because of the collateralization levels we have, we feel really good about. And if one of them were to go under, 
um, we feel good that the other banks, it would take some time, and that's my, that would be my bigger concern is that if uh, one of them went under, how long would it take for them to exercise the FDIC uh, limits and then the collateralization pool to get us our funds? I was actually talking to um, Oregon State Treasury just last week about this same uh, concern. Uh, none of them are at risk that I'm aware of anyways, uh, and, at, and at that level, even the ones that might have been um, are merging. You guys have probably seen a lot of that as well to ensure that that risk is is um, mitigated, and then of course we diversify our portfolio. So, uh, you know, it's kind of that it's that catch twenty two. I was just uh, joking with a colleague from Multnomah County about this, where uh, not joking, haha, but just talking about it, where it's mm -hmm. like, well, if we put all our money in U.S. Bank and didn't diversify at all, mm -hmm. then that would be great. If all the other banks failed, we'd be good. But then on the same vein, if we didn't diversify it and just U.S. Bank failed and none of them failed. You know, we'd be up a crick. So we we we're always kind of balancing that diversification, so that if some of the banks, if one of the banks were to fail, we'd be sitting in a position where it's like, yes, I'd have to come to you and tell you, gosh, this is terrible. Um, however, I would also be saying we're adequately collateralized. We got FDIC and hang tight because we did such a good do job diversifying it. Even though this pot of money is uh, in jeopardy for a little bit, we're hoping in, and and according to my conversation with Oregon State Treasury, they said probably be a few months to work it out. And then we'd be made whole after that kind of circumstance was alleviated. So jumped around a little bit there to no. answer your question. I have a quick follow-up to that that you spurred. Um, See, I talk too much. I, should, I didn't <laughs> want to spur more questions. <laughs> no, I appreciate you, uh, you, your work you do with the county on this stuff. Um, so we know there are very specific economic reasons and phenomenons that have caused kind of this run on the small banks, this issue with them uh, not being financially stable. Some of it has to do with the interest rate. Some of it has to do with some of the things they've invested in and put their resources into. Um, do we monitor and watch our regional banks to see if they are on the same negative um, pathway that uh, that these other bit, like Signature Bank and these other banks were um, engaging in? Do we see within the um, industry a systemic issue potentially that um, could lead to some of our banks doing the same thing? And can we be uh, proactive in, in protecting the public dollars in that sense? Right, Ab absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the short answer is yes. Right. Absolutely, talking to our banks all the time, our investors, and just and, and really just keeping a pulse on the market to make sure that um, yeah, if they're on that path, what are they doing to kind of thwart it? And I, and I, I mean, 100% honest, two of, two of our banks have merged um, with other banks to kind of mitigate that problem um, that, you're, that you're talking about. So it is a, uh, to some extent, a sy systemic problem um, just on what's occurred, but at the same time, keeping a pulse on it to say, okay, the ones that we're invested in are, are holding our money, are you keeping a pulse on it well to make sure that you mitigate that um, circumstances? So, um, yes. And as treasurer, if you say, uh, this is a little bit tenuous, are you able to, to say, oh, we're going to readdress those funds and throw them over here where there's more security? Are you able to kind of keep a pulse? Maybe if you get wind of something saying, I know you're merging and everything, but we're not the litmus test for your success with our public <laughs> dollars. Right. Um, are you able to be that nimble? Yeah, absolutely. The plan? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> if anything, um, from the recent bank failures, um, it has made us uber aware of the financial, and we're no longer, I believe, so complacent. You know, complacency oftentimes drives failures, and that's what I want to guard against. You talk about mergers. I know Umqua Bank bought out Columbia Bank. <laughs> we were at Columbia Bank, and boy, was that fun, and uh, not. And um, what other banks merged locally? Right, so you pointed out the one that we, we work with, which, yes. which is Umqua, and then um, Bank of the West is also working mm. on merging with uh, BM, BMO. So uh, those B are the two. BMO. Uh, Bank Montreal. Mm. Bank of the West. Yeah, Bank of the West is merging with, yeah, uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's BMO is okay. the name of it, sorry. Well, I was just curious yeah. on mm -hmm. that, yeah. And it's possible we could see other of these smaller state chartered banks, it used to be called community banks, it's what Columbia Bank used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a community bank, and you know it's just time to to move on, which is healthy, I believe. Right, absolutely. Commissioner West, can we work with like large credit unions that are basically? Do, do we have that like like First Tech is pretty big. Portland Teachers is really big. There's some big, you know, credit unions out there. Are we because of the structure not able to also invest and work with them, or how does that? Is there some? Right, I don't know. 
No, it's, it's a great question. So uh, probably like you guys, I go to a lot of the chamber events and there's a lot of local banks there working on lending and things of that nature. I'm trying to get a couple of them to become qualified depositories with the Oregon State Treasury, which then would allow us to work with them over the FDIC insurance okay. of $250,000. We've even explored, is it worth it just to put $240,000 in your bank? Because part of it is, and, I, and, I'm, and if I'm not speaking on, uh, for you or with you on this issue, it's like, I want to put Clackamas County funds back in the community, mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. because of the collateralization rules, you have to be a qualified depository if we're going to go over those FDIC or NCU, which is National Credit Union Association, limits uh, of the $250,000. So um, I, I, we, the, um, uh, they just changed their name, Clackamas Federal Credit Union. I'm looking at yeah. the board to, uh, what's the name of it now? Embold. Thank you, Embold. Yeah. So that was, I was working closely with a couple of them and their um, CFO, for lack of a better term, to see, you know, is, is there a way that we can do some more investing in the local community? Because I, I think that at, if my pulse is right on this board and our community, it's like if we have money to invest or, or give, we want to give it back to our the local Clackamas. community. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Schrader? Yeah. Fundamentally, what is the main difference between a professional banking system versus a credit union? Can you, I mean, I think I know, but mm -hmm. I just thought for the public it might be interesting. Right. Know. I mean, the, the, the standards of care can be different as well um, mm -hmm. between, I mean, when we're talking the federal deposit, uh, FDIC insurance and the National Credit Union Association insurance. I mean, at the, in terms of uh, statute and things of that nature, I mean, they're still going to have to go through the state collateralization rules. So definitely there's fundamental differences of being involved in the community, though, because I, I, I would argue that, you know, for the most part, the, the credit unions that are in our community do a very good job of yeah. of being at some of those chamber events and other events to reach out and try and uh, invest back in the community. And, and, and part of our questions have been more recently is, is providing, can you provide information on how your, your, the funds that we're investing with you are then making it back to our um, to Local the, the public of Clackamas County. Too. But we haven't seen the credit unions have the same issues as these as the smaller banks, have we? Is it just different structurally, or is it? I you know, mean, I, I, I I I would be going out on a ledge a little bit, but I okay. think that the structure is a good point. I mean, they're ensuring their liquidity is at the appropriate level to ensure they can okay. fund. You know, not necessarily. I mean, a bank runs really tough, but in general, knowing their clientele to say they're ready to um, be able to provide those funds as needed. Okay, liquidity. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? <clears throat> Treasurer Nava, thank you very much for this very fine report and answering all of our questions. Thanks, nice seeing you guys. Would you, Would you please make a motion to approve the policy? Thank you, Gary. All right, just a moment. Uh, I will accept a motion to approve. Just a minute, let me get it. The um, Clackamas County Treasurer's what? Investment policy. Investment policy. Chair, I move that we approve the Clackamas County Treasurer's investment policy. Second. Commissioner West has moved we approve the Clackamas County Treasurer's investment policy. It has been seconded by Commissioner Schrader. Further discussion? Seeing none, Tony, please call the poll. Commissioner Schull. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner West. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye, motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much, Brian. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Next, legislative update. Trent Wilson from Public and Government Affairs will present. There's one item at least, and that is a draft letter to the governor. And then any other items you want to bring up, Trent? Go ahead, please. Good morning, commissioners. Thanks for having me back. Uh, on May 16th, you as a board approved support of Senate Bill 1044, which was requested by the governor through a series of correspondences with Commissioner West to support uh, new funding on top of what OHA is already trying to do uh, that would go towards substance abuse and behavior, uh, behavioral health. And so this is funding in addition to what the state budget was already trying to accomplish. So this is a priority a funding bill for the governor. Uh, you supported it. We have communicated that support to the legislature as well as with the governor's office that we have followed through on that request. But on May 16th, you also asked us to provide this letter to sort of close the loop on that correspondence that was going on between Commissioner West uh, and the governor. But because it was a board action, we were, are making it a board letter. So that letter is now before you today. And I'm here to answer any questions that I can uh, if you have some. I do have some <clears throat> questions about this letter, but Commissioner West, please go first. Thank you so much. Um, just some clarification. Um, 
on the contents of the letter. And um, overall, I think you guys did a really great job in the response. Uh, can you, um, and, and maybe, Mary, you might help with this too, some of these questions. Um, I see you over there. Uh, so we aim to create mobile in-reach teams that can respond in the first three days of judicial days for when somebody's gonna be potentially um, civically committed or um, they will be directed beyond their, it will no longer be self-directed by, by the patient or the client. It would have to be intervened by the courts for commitment and some type of treatment or care. And I see some conversation here about peer support, which is I think very unique and special within Clackamas County. And does, I guess my question is, does, can you talk to this and does it um, bolster our already very aggressive outreach that has had us um, see a reduction in our, in our numbers of homeless in Clackamas County? I think it's very much connected to the overall wraparound services and significant type of outreach that we do, very specific outreach that is constant. Can, um, and is this something to help um, with that outreach support with this specific population that is at risk? So I will jump in. Good morning, everyone. Mary Rumbaugh, uh, Clackamas County Behavioral Health Division Director. Thank you, uh, Chair Smith and Commissioners, for allowing me to come up. Uh, so a couple, a couple of things, uh, Commissioner West. So one of the things I was asked to do specific to the areas in uh, Senate Bill uh, 1044 in which the dollars would directly come to the community mental health programs was to be able to articulate to you all how we would envision spending those dollars. So for the folks who are in that civil commitment process, we have five days to, to make a recommendation uh, to, to take them to hearing or not. And day three becomes very critical. It really is that point where, you know, are we, are we making that recommendation or are we having a conversation with the hospital about them dropping the hold, the, this this need to then reach in to with this this in, uh, this um, outreach team or in reach team. We used to have it many years ago, and we haven't been able to maintain funding for it. And we uh, that was really the safety net for those folks who um, really were in which the the recommendation was for the hold to be dropped. That's where we actually lose individuals because now the hold is dropped. They can voluntarily leave the hospital, and if we don't have that safety net, they are more at risk of um, recidivism, homelessness. Um, obviously, not on their path to recovery. And then the enhanced uh, peer model, I, I think actually does continue to just enhance all of the important work we're doing with our houseless population. Um, but I think this, this, the civilly committed group or the folks who could be at risk of civil commitment, they, they still, there's still some gaps that they're following through that the rest of the system isn't capturing. So I think this, this advocacy would be, this is how we're leaning into really what is actually a small population, but a really intense population. So, so that was really my proposal for if we were to receive these dollars to be able to articulate to you all how, I would, how m m me and my team believe those dollars would be, be best invested. Would you agree that the small population that is often in acute crisis uses a, a large portion of the resources available, and with these gaps, we're less effective in targeting those resources towards the patient's individual needs? Correct. Yes, okay. I agree. And have you seen this work in the past, even though we don't have funding for it now, have you seen it be successful in treating, helping people get the treatment they need? Yes, especially for the folks in which they are not going to go through the civil commitment process so that we, if, again, they have to, these are voluntary, but if if they agree to allow sort of this, this peer case management team to sort of follow them out of the hospital, we're more likely to actually get them connected or reconnected to treatment services. It seems quite relationship-based and oriented. Um, do you... Um, uh, do you think that um, if we were able to get funding for this, it would be a really good asset to help um, get people treatment and get them on a pathway to recovery? 100%. We see it day in and day out with the current programs that we have. They're all very relationship-based, and they just have to be. And again, that's the, the role of peers become very critical because that peer, we hire peers who have gone through that same system. They're able to articulate to that individual what it, what it was like to be under a civil commitment, what it was like to be in jail. You know, those those lived mm -hmm. lived stories really go a long way for somebody who maybe is somewhat treatment apprehensive or treatment resistant. 
Okay, thank you. I think that's really great for explaining that. Um, on the second paragraph in the middle of it, it says, while Clackamas County is the primary provider of outpatient substance use and mental health services to individuals on the Oregon Health Plan, and those who are uninsured, we have a long history of supporting the CBOs for, that's the, um, uh, the coordinated um, community-based organizations, organization. thank you, in the development of a more intensive services such as residential programs through the one-time startup cost and letters of support. So I'm honing in on residential programs or more of a long-term recovery process, which I believe would also include housing. Housing would be necessary in that. Um, is this... Um, do we what what is available now and why is that specific resource you think valuable to your team um, in asking the governor to support it? I think here, so so when you look at Senate Bill 1044, there were uh, particular areas where the dollars would be allocated directly through a, hopefully a formula to the community mental, community mental health programs, um, CMHPs, there's 32 of us across the, the 36 counties. And then there's these other buckets of funding, including residential. I think what this paragraph is really saying is Clackamas County, we, we don't do residential. That's just not, that's not our... That's not our expertise. The Columbia Cares, the Cascadias, the LifeWorks Northwest, they, they are the ones who, who have the expertise. Um, and so really what this paragraph is saying is we're not ignoring that. What our role is then um, anytime a new program is, is set up, there are requests for letters of support. We have an oversight component in partnership with the state. So really what this, the, this paragraph is trying to articulate is our commitment that those funds become very critical. We need more more residential, um, and that our, I see our role, my role in particular, um, as, as supporting any, any interested community-based organization who would want to set up you know, additional, it, whether it's expansion or a new program here in Clackamas County. It, it's my understanding we also don't have the infrastructure to be, for them to do those services. So where are they gonna do the services and the basic um, sticks and bricks to get those things up and running? Though we have a lot of vision and ideas of this board that, and I think we wanna go down that route to try to get those essential infrastructure pieces established here in our county. But I, it, um, it, in the last paragraph, it looks like you guys address the addiction treatment and recovery. Do we talk much about like we need this funding to help support the infrastructure so these CBOs can be effective in the work that they do, but without the proper infrastructure um, and not just programming? We we aren't going to get there. We need trauma informed, state of the art, good facilities for people to get the care they need. And I don't quite see that super articulated in this letter. I don't know. I think we try to balance that here towards the end of the letter with some good feedback from uh, Chair Smith's office as it was in draft form, which is that there are going to be, these dollars are statewide, so they're going to have to be shared amongst a lot of different providers. And at the same time, we are hoping that the governor and the state legislature and counties can start working together in a more collaborative way to trust that at the local level, we have a little bit more um, of a level view or an eye level view of what's needed here in Clackamas County. So if there's some partnership or those dollars can be like locally directed or have some local control, I think that's something that we try to communicate in here in, in more of a, in a pretty I'd collaborative like to address way. address that if you okay. don't want And to. I'm done, Go, yeah, feel free. So I read this letter and my spidey senses went right at my spine and I said, okay, look, <clears throat> I went through the governor already saying, oh, I'm going to give more housing to you, and there's going to be $10 million available to you, and here's the program that you need to do. When, in fact, this county has been doing the program for many years. And then she comes back and says, well, I don't see how you're going to meet my metrics and what I want for your county. Therefore, you're only going to get $4.6 million of the $10 million. What I asked for in this letter, I do not see. And that I want to make very clear, yes, we support this program. We are already doing this. However, we cannot accept at this point in this important juncture a mandate that says, even though, county, we think you're wonderful, you're going down this path, we think you should go down this path instead. We cannot turn on a dime because somebody in the legislature thinks they know how to deliver services better than we do. The legislature does not know how to deliver services. We are the boots on the ground for the legislature, and I've been in both bodies. 
I was on Ways and Means for four years in the longest sessions ever and the most special sessions on both education and human services. So what I asked for in this letter, Trent, you talked around it, but you did not directly put in this letter. Therefore, I'm going to pull the letter today. And you and I will sit down and I will insert language in there that's satisfactory because we cannot have, at one point, staff in the county, we have to start saying enough is enough. So we're going to pull this letter and you can come in my office and we're going to add some language. Gary. So you, you addressed your concerns with me, Chair Smith. Does a second to the last paragraph not address your concern or could no, it be? No, it does not. Okay. It is like bubble gum when we have a dam breaking, okay? And I appreciate that you're trying to be soft and pliable, but I've got news for you. That freight train that's coming down the legislature right now and Governor Kotek is very specific and she, if she doesn't get it, we're called out again and I don't want to be another headline, okay? Thank you for that feedback. Okay, so we're going to pull up. We're going to go back, Commissioner West. Um, and I think it's okay to pull because there's some more massaging to do here. I, there's a lot of good in here, and we've addressed it today. I wish that we had a little bit more to say. We need funding for good infrastructure plans that get the resources and to the people. You need the infrastructure. You know, it's hard to treat, as a nurse, it's hard to treat somebody if I don't have a clinic or a hospital or the resources to do it, right? Um, and so we have the programming. There's great partners in that. I like a little language about, because there is in this bill 15 million, I think could be used for that. And she actually does say, recovery centers, which we've talked a lot about, which is kind of a novel idea in the metro area. So maybe a little language about how we could maybe from, through our county's eyes and our lens in here, I would appreciate something like that maybe. But so, there's a lot of good here in this draft. So I want to be clear. It's $15 million for the entire state, commissioners. If we get $1 million, I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be worth having to comply to every single checkbox that somebody else has envisioned. I'm going to tell you that right now. And as chair, I could reject those funds if it's not an enhancement of the programs where I'm not interested in developing some new program. And I, we have to sit down and go over this bill and just make sure that our support letter is conditional. I want to be very clear on that. Ben, we're only talking about a million or two million or two million to Clackamas County, okay, in, in the whole picture of everything we have going. I'm just, it's my gut on this. I think we're going we're gonna to do this and let's develop some language that's acceptable. Yeah, and I want to just clarify too, like the, the money that's in this bill I don't believe it's, um, I don't believe it's, and I can double check, but that it's creating new mandates or new, it's, it's creating new money to expand programs that already exist, to create new infrastructure where it doesn't exist already. And so it's, it's money in addition to things that we're already working on or that could be available in addition to things that we're already working so on. So I really want to believe that too. However, I do not. All right. Thank you. Commissioner West. I, I'll say this is, um, I, I get the unfunded mandates and the bureau, bureaucratic strains that are often tied to money. I don't. I agree with the chair on that. Um, but as we look to maybe do some innovative stuff around the recovery center, which we're sharing language with the governor on this, and every one of these emails back and forth between me and her office, she is open to helping us build, I believe, some type of recovery infrastructure. And if we have to braid some funds together from different sources, one or $2 million from the state, along with other resources that we have and SHS dollars and whatnot, can go a long way to build some type of campus or recovery center. Um, but we do have to be careful of what strings are attached here and are you giving local control to do the work that it knows, because we know our community the best, or are we being, you know, working with one arm tied behind our back through a bureaucratic mess? I think both those things are I just essential. Said that. Yeah. I'm just confirming, you know, and, you and agreeing. So, um, I, I, so when you, when you, when we look at this, much of the critique that we've had, um, on the ground is governor legislature. There's so many strings attached to so many different types of fun that we are not able to move as quickly as everybody would like us to move. Um, and it makes it, makes it a little bit harder. So I think that's a good lens to maybe address within the letter too. 
And I'm wondering if I could uh, respond to Commissioner West. So when we talk about infrastructure, I'm really glad you brought this up because I do wonder if we want to, to be um, a little even more uh, articulate. In the last two legislative sessions, there was large investments in behavioral health housing, some of it direct, directly to, to community mental health programs. Most of it was about 300 million that was available just to community-based organizations to apply. And it was actually for infrastructure, but no ongoing funding. My concern, continues to be if we end up really focusing on just building up, you know, allowing for bricks and sticks, which there has to be some flexibility. Some of the funding, it literally was only for bricks and sticks, and then there was no Perhaps. operating. And that's my concern. I actually think there are already still dollars out there for bricks and sticks, but where, where the legislature has, has lagged the last two years is being able to be flexible enough with those dollars to say, oh, and by the way, you can use it for operating. So even the, the behavioral health housing investment that, that, that we're receiving receiving, it, once the money is gone, the money is gone. And so, you know, and luckily it was, that was the most flexible. We could use it for a purchase. We could use it for operating. And then when it's gone, we have to look at, again, how are we're, bra how we're braiding. So I wonder if there's a way to just be a little bit more explicit about, like, mm -hmm. infrastructure is important, but if we don't have funding ongoing for operating, yeah. you can build the best program well, possible. Well, a conundrum, and we've heard yeah. that before, too, and this board is very much concerned about that, and we voice those uh, concerns. You know, what's first, the chicken or the egg? I know. You can't deliver services unless you have a place to put people. Exactly. You can't treat people unless we can get them off the streets. So it's a huge societal debate that continually that rages. What I'm going to say is we can only do what we can do at each particular moment in time. This letter is one particular moment in time with a very small amount of money that we will receive even a smaller amount of money. And I want to guard and protect what we're doing in this county without additional mandates on top of us for a very little small amount of money. Thank you, Commissioner Sh Schrader. Yeah. Um, so my understanding is that the operations with what we do I understand this is, is separate from the sticks and bricks. But I guess my, my question is, what will the model be? Would a sticks and bricks be, maybe this is to my colleagues, largely be under the auspice of a CBO, a community organization? Community-based organization. Yeah. Or would it, because that's what I'm hearing from you, Mary, is that you can build it, but if you don't have the operational money, is this more of a public nonprofit partnership with sticks and bricks as a piece of it. Because as you said, my understanding, the opioid money, which is what we've been talking about, is only one time, right? That's it. And then it's gone. So we can use it for whatever we want to use it for. But And if it is to operationalize, then uh, that's not a good thing. So I, I think there's more that at least I have to understand in my head about how that would work because do we as a county want to actually take over and run a sticks and brick center or do we work with a nonprofit to build something of substance where again we collaborate and coordinate together that's that's kind of how i'm seeing it and if i if i can just address that commissioner schrader yeah. my advocacy will always be wherever possible, we're, we're supporting a community-based organization. Okay. The dollars stretch okay. farther. I'm sorry, we're just very expensive employees. And I think we have a place in the continuum for services and supports, but things like large recovery centers, residential, the dollars will just stretch farther. And that's their area of expertise, and that's what we should be, in my, in my okay. humble opinion, that's what we should no, be supporting. And I'm just, see, I think that there's a way to get there, and I think it's necessary. I do agree we don't have any place to put people. You, and just with my visits to the hospitals, not being a, uh, a nurse like my colleague, but they have expressed to me, um, again, that's what they're facing, no place to put these folks. So there's even a possibility of a collaboration with our hospital systems, or as you said, a private system coming in to just give us that, uh, that yeah. space. So, but not, but you're a collaborator with them. You're not going to be alone in operationalizing. Right. Those things. Yep. Okay. Okay. Not being clear. Okay. Thank you. Concluding statement. I, I just wanted to address my colleague Commissioner Schrader's um, comments about this. Um, I would say yes. 
Okay. Right. So where is the best partnership? I don't see the county running a large recovery center. I think that would be inefficient and a giant burden on what our capabilities are and our scope of ability. Um, but being able to find the appropriate partner, um, whether it's a nonprofit that's quite skilled in this or a CBO or Mary, we would collaborate and and and, um, and work in a way to find that best partner. Uh, I think is essential, but sometimes f getting that facility piece of that, that appropriate, you know, asset and infrastructure up, not just around programming. We have a lot of programmers right now in the metro area. We lack quality infrastructure. Um, and when we say a recovery center, it sounds like the governor agrees with that statement. There have been, what is the third or fourth letter between basically us and her um, on that issue. And she, in our meeting, um, was uh, very open and acknowledged the need to help the county and specifically Clackamas County in helping it get a recovery center or recovery oriented system of care off the ground and agreed with us. Um, and so I just, I appreciate the continued dialogue with her, but um, I just don't see that little nuance piece about infrastructure here. So there's a little massaging to you, but we're on our way with the draft and thank you. Thank you and we can work with your PAs to schedule that time to, to work on those edits. Any other discussion on this issue? Trent, do you have anything else for our legislative update? Longest walkout in Oregon's history. Mm -hmm. um, okay. When did that happen? <laughs> Five weeks ago. Five weeks ago. <laughs> um, I do have a question regarding defunding of the medical examiner. Can you answer that question? You asked if the state's trying to defund uh, county medical program, medical examiner programs. Is that Was that the question? I think the state medical examiner office is in this sort of in-between state of where they were and where they're trying to get to. And they, um, when the legislative session was in full motion, uh, they were trying to nuance some very interesting things. I don't know if the state legislature is fully focused on that in the same way that you know we might be here with some of our concerns. I think they're trying to figure out how to like keep the house and the divorce. And we're talking about you know the garbage bill or what we're going to eat on Thursday <laughs> with with this well, particular issue. That There's may just be so true, many unknowns. But this is a huge medical situation across all counties in the state of Oregon. Is there a bill that would do this? It's in the OHA's budget, so it's okay, kind so of being nuanced there. OHA budget, and from what I understand, Trent and our crack um, lobby team, that when they return on, uh, they're gonna sign a guy and possibly return in the end of the month, that they're gonna be passing budget bills. So if this is hidden in the budget bill, that's very dangerous. It's, it could be hidden, but we've been working with uh, other counties, the 14 other counties who participate in the same way. We've been providing uh, what our financial need is. If this transition is going to happen, we've been very clear and, and submitting what we need to be successful in this regard. So we will be, we will have, we will have records of sharing what we need to do to be successful. Thank you. And is the Association of Oregon Counties take a position on this? I believe they have, but I know that doesn't affect all 36 counties, but I can confirm that. There are medical examiners in all 36 counties. Right, but the changes that the state medical examiner offices is trying to implement doesn't affect all 36. It's because of, it's complicated, and I wish Daniel were here still, but it's because we don't hire our own, but we have an office, and so we're in we, some sort of contract with the yes, state. And that's always been kind of a different situation. Is the Office of Medical Examiner a constitutional requirement for counties? I don't know. We need to find that out. And if it's a core county service. And if we have to fund it ourselves, mm, there goes some other important program maybe legislators would want. Just saying. It's time we draw a line in the sand and make sure we get what is constitutionally required and the new legislature doesn't start taking stuff away because it's, it is expedient. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming forward. Very good work. Gary, what's next? Next review of your business meeting agenda for this Thursday, June 8, 2023, 6 p.m. It's an evening business meeting. All you have is all the consent agenda items you discussed today and public communication and the regular agenda. If you have any questions, please let me know prior to Thursday. Final item today is Commissioner Communications. Commissioners, uh, communications. Commissioner Schrader, do you want to go first? Yeah, I just want to say um, I, it was really great to go up to the mountain uh, this weekend for our first uh, in-person 
you know, CC4, which is the Clackamas <laughs> Coordinating Council, which includes uh, us, our mayors from our cities, our uh, representatives from our community planning organizations. And I think uh, everyone else can say a few words about it because we were all there. It has become perfectly clear that uh, it was interesting to me that years ago we weren't always united on uh, particular subjects, but on this issue of tolling, it seems to be 100%, uh, listen, we need to push back uh, on this in a big way. So I left feeling um, really that C4 is doing at this point what it was really originally uh, uh, plan to do was to reduce conflict between us and our other neighbors in government, uh, to improve communication between our community planning organizations, our cities, and the county, and that this is going to be a unifying experience as we work through this issue of tolling, the fairness of it, the equity of it, how it's going to affect our folks, and how at this point in time we are all it's, uh, unanimously opposed. Uh, to uh, moving forward with this as uh, as written at this point. So more to come with that. It was also great to see my colleagues uh, in a more informal setting, um, you know, and, and have you know have time just to chat with things that we really wanted to do. Um, one of the things that uh, I'll be doing at the national level, I wanted to mention this. Um, I am a chair of a national committee, Community Economic and Workforce Development. And uh, as such, I will be uh, pushing forward a proposed resolution uh, on the Economic Development Administration reauthorization. And this is the policy. The National Association of Counties urges the U.S. Congress to appropriate funding and reauthorize the U.S. Department of Commerce, Education, Economic Development Administration as follows. And there is a whole list of things that the EDA does. Uh, one of the things that I've been working with with our new economic uh, director and, um, and their staff is uh, the EDA and um, how do we regionally collaborate to bring together stakeholders to develop regional strategies and goals for economic development. And that organization, regional organization, is Greater Portland, Inc. I'm sorry they call it Greater Portland, Inc. I would, I would say uh, something different. I haven't thought of what a different name I would use for that. But uh, in my opinion, we have not been leveraging uh, opportunities, and I think we will start to now, of uh, getting development opportunities for economic development directly from the EDA as we work with um, the Greater Portland Group to get those monies here to our region. And I think one of the things that we're going to be doing is to take a close look at that and see if we have been leaving money on the table for this county, that's kind of my goal with this. We haven't really, and um, yeah, I'll get the I'll get the resolution to you. Um, they usually ask me to do it every year. Uh, I have another resolution I've been thinking of doing. It's a little bit too late to drop it now, but as I work with the early child care group and I work with um, our workforce group here, that's identifying. Uh, child care as an economic driver, and actually one of the top business issues that people are having is, again, if they can't have child care, then they can't get to work, and then they can't move up that economic mobility ladder. So um, I'm going to be talking about that. Uh, we're going to be pulling together a conversation with our local businesses at the end of June through our workforce committee. And uh, what my priority has been is really trying to get the businesses that have had child care available and have that available to their, um, to their employees as an employer of choice because it helps them get to work and not get to work. So I don't know where it's going to lead yet because I tend to be open-ended because I know in the end uh, kind of things happen. Uh, the way they're supposed to happen. Uh, I did talk with uh, 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 Brett Baker from Springboard, and uh, he's a local philanthropist and very well connected in the region. And um, he has talked to me about this as well, and hopefully I'll be, have an opportunity to invite him to a conference. So those are the kinds of things I've been uh, quietly working on as we move forward with this. Um, 
AOCs coming up this week. I, I usually attend the Sunday meetings virtually because I'm on the executive committee, uh, but it looks as if I'm going to try and get down on Monday physically for a change to go ahead and talk to everybody and do a check-in with the Association of Oregon Counties, and um, we'll take it from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Your resolution, does uh, this board need to give you uh, support on that? Or uh, that would okay? be, no, that would be great if the board would support this. This and is a pretty simple. Do timeline for that? Um, it, it'll happen this July, so we're okay. So if you want to write a letter of support to do that. To okay, Gary great. Just put it on a, right. on a track for us to support that. Yeah, that would be, that would be so fantastic. Long, but, that would be good. And, More and, the merrier. And I will try and work on a resolution in the future that deals with the human services component as well as the economic development component of child care. I haven't gotten that fleshed out yet. But I think it crosses two of those arenas. I, th I think it is an economic driver that gets people back to work. Um, but I also know that you know there's the early childhood component of, P of PK through three. I'm a member of that group. About the earlier you get kids, um, you know, to help families really know how to parent and be good parents. The 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 way you have programs that helps you know children grow and learn. Um, you usually stave off a lot of potential problems later in their development. And like I didn't have a problem. You know, I grew up with an Italian family, so we were parented by everybody. But uh, <laughs> it's true. They just handed babies off to various people, you know. And, and, and so I'm facetious about it. But so, but it, not everybody has that kind of structure, you know, where, where you can learn from, you know, maybe a familial family. But it's also, how do we, how do we work with this so young kids you know, can get what they need to succeed in life because brain development at that those ages is just uh, pretty uh, goes real fast, and it really helps with future outcomes to make sure they're getting what they need. So, sorry, I did mean to wax eloquent. Thank but, you very okay. much. Up yeah. next, Commissioner West. Uh, yeah, C four was a really great event. It was my first C four retreat. <laughs> Um, day one, we talked about housing. Looks like C4 might be expanding. Um, oh, actually, I'll back up. I and, and I have the honor to serve as the Clackamas County liaison. Paul uh, Savas, Commissioner Savas, is the chair, uh, co-chair with Brian Hodson, Mayor Camby, and then I am assigned as the county's uh, um, representative um, with Commissioner Savas. And it looks like that we're going to be expanding into housing and discussing. They've already yeah. done a lot of land use conversations in the past. Mostly transportation uh, has been the focus of the, the 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 electeds with on the local municipal level and here at the county level. But now it looks like because housing is such an kind of a, a strong intersection with all of those topics that the C4 is looking to do more along the lines of housing. Um, and talking about like homelessness, um, what are some of those causations and drivers? What are some things that we can do better to collaborate with our um, local electeds, with the cities? Um, what's working where? Who's doing what? What isn't working? Don't try this. We like this. We don't like that. Some good collaboration. Some of the most significant conversation I think though was in day two. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I'm still like everybody. I, I say this all the time. We all know I'm still new at this, but there was not. I can't think of any daylight really between the different cities in Clackamas County and the county itself on the tolling issue, and being very strategic about how, as a county and with our local cities, how we want to continue to be drivers in. Um, trying to make sure that we get positive outcomes regarding this tolling debate in Clackamas County and that we um, continue to do it in such a way that inspires hopefully the legislature and our Clackamas caucus to come um, and advocate for us in the legislature. But a lot of the great work on the tolling issue is really coming and, and is really being done on the very most local level. And so that was great to see. Uh, the concerns, the strategizing, the how do we continue this 
um, this fight going forward to advocate for our local region and communities. Um, where can we be successful? Where is it not good? What path do we not take? And so there was a lot of synergy around that. Um, and then I really enjoyed the opportunity to um, actually just get to know some of these folks, including our very talented staff and senior staff there. Um, it was quite, um, and that might have been the, for me even the most important thing as somebody who's new is building those essential relationships, finding that common ground, and then also, you know, leaning on and hearing from our talented staff here in Clackamas County and the good work that they do on a, on a variety of issues. And so that opportunity uh, was afforded and I really appreciate it. Um, and I think uh, having those opportunities help us have a better, stronger culture here in Clackamas County and on the municipal level. So uh, overall, it was really great. I appreciated it. I um, look forward to those continued conversations in, in C4. And um, I'm, you know, and I look forward to uh, how we're going to continue to do, I think, the, the will of our constituents and our constituents um, in Clackamas County uh, are very concerned about housing and homelessness issues, but we're real concerned about tolling. And so I think there's a lot of agreement there. So with that, I, uh, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be quiet. <laughs> but yeah, so um, uh, yeah, it was a great opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner Scholl. Yes, thank you. Uh, I too had a good time at the Clackamas County Coordinating Committee meeting over the weekend. Um, I'm hoping that the C4 will be able to influence ODOT and the Oregon Transportation Council to bring some common sense to uh, the problem of highway funding and improvement in Oregon, and also to continue to bring focus on the inefficiency of tolling and the importance of supporting IP4 vote before tolls.org. Uh, this afternoon, I'll be attending the Metro sta State of the Region update at the World Trade Center. Tomorrow night, I'll attend the Clarks Highland Community Planning Organization meeting. And uh, hopefully this evening, get some time to sit in my garden and enjoy the sunshine. Thank you. That's right, Commissioner Shaw. Today is uh, going to be a very nice day. Uh, I, too, attended the C4 and the conversation on tolling. I do agree with Commissioner West. There's very little daylight from what the cities are thinking and, and want to do in Clackamas County. I believe Cat Clackamas County is a leader in this, and we might want to um, pursue some uh, paths that were raised uh, at this meeting, but we're going to wait till July uh, uh, to see um, how things um, fall out. There's a new transportation subcommittee name to handle this and we'll see what kind of momentum they get on that and whether they do anything and uh, what I was reminded of it's very important House Bill 2017 is still in effect the governor did not stop that because the governor does not have the ability to stop that she under her authority she made a technical change on uh, installing the polling gantries so unless the legislature totally comes in and revamps and overturns somewhat uh, House Bill 2017, tolling is going to proceed, and I made that point very, very clear, okay? We are not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. Tomorrow, commissioners, we have some very important policy sessions ahead of us. Uh, it's, they are quite meaty. I'm looking forward to them, and I'm looking forward to all of our participation in them. Last night, I attended a very special uh, dinner. I was invited by Portland General Electric. It was the PGE Officers Board and Community Leaders event. It was held at OMSI on the waterfront off of Clay and Water, see, Water Avenue, I think is what it's called, in Turbine Hall. Turbine Hall, Mark may remember, it's the old PGE co-generation co facility, and they still have the big cranes that go and they're painted bright yellow and now it's a children's museum but um, it was very significant that we dined there last night it was a very eclectic mix of leaders from around um, the region uh, a few electeds were there uh, we had people from industry uh, high-tech education uh, the Port of Portland was represented to discuss uh, PGE's further initiatives 
on carbon reduction and green energy. Um, and they are looking for partnerships. However, I will be meeting with them to discuss further what their plans are. And as you know, we have partnered with Portland General Electric on several uh, initiatives last year and this year for re and this year reapplying for the BRIC grant of $500,000 uh, so they can put in underground power from boring up the mountain. And that's a redo because the language wasn't quite right the first time around. So we're working on that as well. Uh, more to come on that as we engage in conversations. Uh, their goal is to be carbon, 80% carbon free by 2030. That is a huge lift and then net carbon neutral by 2050. And yes, I am very concerned how that's going to impact local governments as we go forward. So I'm looking forward to continued conversations with them. Seeing no further business before this board, we are adjourned. Um.